For many people, Robin, the answer here is we just fly less. We take out capacity because we've proven over the last six to nine months we don't need it. What's the response from the airline industry, Robin? Jonathan, uh, thanks for having me uh, on today. Well, I haven't met many people in the last uh, nine or ten months who don't want to fly again. So I think, uh, you know, most of us are looking at the uh, pandemic as uh, a reason to uh, avoid flying for the short term. But, but certainly longer term, uh, the need is going to be there. And so the question is, how do we grow in a sustainable way, making sure that our industry uh, can, can contribute fully uh, in um, uh, navigating uh, the planet through the uh, climate crisis. And I think restricting aviation, making aviation only available to the rich and wealthy isn't the right way to be thinking about it. What is the right way then, Robin? Well, we have to reduce, uh, you know, we have to reduce our carbon uh, footprint. And um, that, that's why we made the uh, commitment that we did. It's about uh, the uh, development of sustainable aviation fuels, which I think think uh, have a huge promise in the industry. Uh, it's uh, more fuel efficient engines of which we're investing billions of dollars in uh, new airplanes. Uh, we are moving our ground equipment over to uh, uh, electric ground equipment. We've already done that here at our uh, main base of operations in uh, uh, New York. It's about more efficient air traffic control procedures. So we aren't flying airplanes around uh, in circles around airports. And you know, the amount of um, carbon an airplane will admit, emit is much lower at lower altitudes and higher altitudes. And so things like better air traffic control procedures can make a, a real difference. And it's about uh, offsetting uh, where we can't, because it is going to take some time for some of this technology to uh, catch up. For anyone flying New York into Heathrow, or for that matter, Robin, anyone flying into Heathrow, they're used to that circle. You go round and you go round for 40 minutes waiting to land. People haven't missed that, Robin. As you point out, though, many people have missed travelling. And what we've experienced in the last several months is that leisure has returned first. Leisure first, this idea that business comes second. Robin, has your strategy around the business traveller changed at all after the experience of the last six to nine months, or is it as you were? Well, we are, for, for JetBlue, we're about 80% leisure, 20% business, so we've always skewed more heavily to the leisure uh, sector. Uh, I completely agree with what you said, Jonathan. I mean, our view is that leisure uh, will has already started uh, coming back and will continue to do so. You know, I think a lot has been written about business travel and what happens. And look, I certainly believe that there will be companies that have learned to do business in different ways. And I think it will be some time, maybe several years before business travel uh, returns fully. Uh, but we also think there'll be a proportion of business travel that will come back. Uh, in the next one to two years. There are certain types of industry, whether it's sales, uh, distribution, logistics, where people really do need to travel. And, and those sorts of sectors, we think, will, uh, will, will, will come back. But for us, what we've done is we've pivoted a significant amount of uh, our business travel capacity, and we're flying to new leisure markets. In fact, during this pandemic, uh, we've announced service to over 60 new uh, leisure markets. And so I think we've uh, demonstrated that we need to be nimble during a time like this. Do you think you remain nimble, or, Robin, does that become a permanent shift? I mean, I should put it out there that I was once the business traveller with you guys in your mint offering. I'm a Mosaic member, fully signed up. LA, New York, New York, LA, in mint. It was fantastic, and I enjoyed every single ride. And I put that out there so everybody knows full transparency. Robin, going forward, though, I don't think the boss is going to send me out on as many trips over the next several years. And I wonder whether that skew towards leisure, Robin, is something that, that sticks, just how sticky that is. Well, uh, I think he will be sending you out, Jonathan, because uh, we're also going to be starting flights between uh, New York and London next year. And so uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you on that, even if we don't see so much of you on our LAX flights. But, uh, no, look, I, I, I'm, I, I think there is going to be uh, some shift in uh, business travel. But we also don't fully understand some of the new markets that may be created. So, for example, if we are really going to have a lot more people who are working from home, working remote, that, you know, companies are OK if they're working in other parts of the country, you know, there's going to be, I'm sure organizations are still going to want to get people together once or twice a year. So that's going to create uh, new markets in travel that perhaps uh, aren't there today. So I think before we write off business travel, let, let's see what plays out. But what JetBlue is doing is we're continuing to pivot more of our capacity to, to leisure, uh, people vacationing, people visiting friends and family, where we actually think there's pent-up demand in 2021. We think that 
A lot of people have put off trips this year. Uh, they're not going to put off going to see family uh, for much longer. So they're going to travel in 2021. And we need to make sure that we're there to uh, serve them when they do. Have you started to see the cancellations pick up again in December, Robin? We saw a little bit of a pickup uh, ahead of the uh, Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and, um, you know, Thanksgiving was still relatively strong. We still had a, a you know, significant number of people uh, flying. I think uh, for several days, U.S. airports were over a million uh, passengers for the first time. Um, we've seen that um, elevated level of cancellations run through to December. But, um, you know, uh, for example, last two weeks of December, we're expecting to fly two-thirds of our normal schedule, which I think shows you there's still um, you know, some uh, in demand in uh, flying. We're seeing quite a bit of interest in uh, beach markets and people wanting to uh, take vacations over the uh, holiday. The sweet spot for bookings, usually the start of the new year, looking ahead to the Easter period, to spring, looking ahead to the summer as well, Robin. Just give me a read on bookings right now from November into December, what that month-on-month -month sequential outlook actually looks like. Yeah, so, um, you know, I talked about the last two weeks of December where capacity we're expecting to uh, be about um, um, 33, so about a third down of what we normally fly. Um, January, we're expecting uh, capacity to be about 45%. Booking vacations. So our vacations company uh, has actually had seen quite strong demand into the second quarter of next year. And January is normally a very busy period for people booking vacations into the uh, spring and summer. And so we are actually expecting a, a relatively strong uh, January for bookings further into the uh, year. We think for January and February, uh, you know, uh, and travel may still um, stay uh, uh, suppressed. This, of course, will have consequences for cash burn and how much aid this industry needs, Robin. Have you been speaking to the administration, to government recently, and where are we? Oh, look, I'm going to say what most other Americans have said. We need a stimulus bill. The country needs a stimulus bill. It's not just airlines. I heard you, before I came on the show, talking about restaurant workers right here in New York City. You know, indoor dining closes down again. People need help. And uh, I think yeah. it's very important that members of Congress know that and they don't leave for the holidays until they've uh, taken care of business and they've delivered the American people uh, a relief bill. I'll ask you a little bit of a tricky question. I caught up with the administration a couple of weeks ago and their view was that they didn't want to offer aid to states that they said, quote, were poorly managed. And I always thought that that was somewhat inconsistent because you could apply that thinking to certain parts of the airline industry that maybe they've been poorly managed for not saving for a, quote, rainy day nobody expected. Robin, with that in mind, what's the argument at the moment? And I ask this with the best of intentions. From your perspective, the argument at the moment, this airline industry needs more aid and should get it. Well, the aid for the airline industry since the beginning has been about protecting jobs. Um, all of the airlines in the U.S. That, that got assistance, and we were very grateful for it, were able to protect jobs. As soon as that aid stopped at the end of September, uh, you saw a significant number of furloughs in the industry. Uh, people getting furloughed is creating a lot of uncertainty for them and their families, uh, and they're claiming unemployment benefit and other benefits in, in any case. And so the uh, CARES Act was really about pe keeping people uh, on, the, uh, on the payroll. And I think... Uh, just as we talked about restaurants, talked talk about other industry sectors. I think the difference now to the beginning of the pandemic, it's much clearer to all of us which particular sectors are the most impacted. The travel sector, whether it's airlines, hotels, restaurants, um, uh, theme parks, uh, contribute significantly to our GDP. They contribute significantly to jobs. And so the need to protect these sectors so that they're there when people want to start flying again next year, uh, I think it's really uh, important.